Okay, good afternoon, good morning, rather. So for this morning, we will have two topics. The first would be normal pregnancy and diagnosis. Your past lectures, you've been shown your a review of your anatomy, a review of your physiology, different changes that we encounter for normal pregnancy and the like. Now we are to try to apply it, to start applying it, and how we could um, apply this knowledge into clinical practice and thereby apply it in diagnosing pregnancy and what a normal pregnancy should look like. Okay, So this is in preparation for your obstetrics too, wherein we discuss everything abnormal. For your obstetrics one, we focus on what happens in a normal pregnancy so that in the latter part of your obstetric courses, you will able, be able to identify what is abnormal by knowing the normal with the palm of your hand. Okay? So, most basic would be knowing how to compute your menstrual age, okay? Normal pregnancy, so that's equivalent to your gestational age. And that is equivalent to the first day of the last menstrual period, okay? Often when you ask your patient, when was your last menses? And they would often say the last day. So it's important to emphasize first day of your last menstrual period, okay? And your pregnancy will last for approximately nine months and seven days. And that would be equivalent to 280 days, which is your 40 weeks, which is when computed would be equivalent to your estimated due date. Okay, it's a rule. So when the first day of the last month is given, okay, how do you get your estimated due date? You add seven days and subtract three months. Okay, if you need to add a year, then you do add a year. That computation you will end up with your 40 weeks. Okay. Once you have your 40 weeks. You will count your age of gestation. Okay, I know that there are applications for you to compute. You just input the date and you, your AOG would be given. But of course, during exams and at your level, we expect you that you compute your AOG from scratch. So you count the number of days 
until that due date and then divide it by 7. Whatever you get would be your age of gestation. That those two computing for your estimated due date Computing for your age of gestation would be one of the most basic skills in obstetrics. So master it because most of the questions, if it's a two-step question, you have to know age of gestation and due date to be able to answer the question correct. Okay, so menstrual age. To 80 days, 40 weeks. Okay. This is the event divided into trimesters. First trimester would be your first to 12 weeks. Second trimester would be 13 to 28 weeks. And third trimester would be 29 to 40 weeks and beyond. Okay. Diagnosis of pregnancy would vary according to trimester and would have different symptoms depending on what stage the pregnancy is at. Okay, for the first trimester, how do we diagnose? Often, your patient will come to you with this problem. Okay, but often they have already what do you call this? They have already done a pregnancy test, but of course, first indication that one is pregnant more most often would be cessation of menses. And menses occur because your estrogen and your breast progesterone increases because of pregnancy. And this occurs in your corpus luteum. Okay. There is slight bleeding. At the expected time of menses, which rarely occurs in the first three months. Okay, so this is scanty. And this is also called your Hartman sign or placental sign. Okay, this should not be confused with threatened abortion or menses, which is often the case. That's why most would say, that's why it's also important that to establish your previous menstrual period. Because what they may consider as their last menses may be your Hartman sign. Okay, so if it if your physical examination and your last menses do not concur then you compute using your previous menstrual period, okay? But in general, we compute using your LMP, okay? Some would treat, but this is often an over-treatment for threatened abortion. But then again, you could never be so sure. So most obstetricians clinically would rather treat than allowing bleeding but and doing nothing, what if it was abortion, then there's there would be a problem. Okay. Okay. Often romanticized in movies, in the television, morning sickness, which has validity because it occurs in 50% of cases. Okay. And this usually appears following the missed period and may persist up to 12 weeks, 16 weeks age of cessation. Okay. Nausea and vomiting, most especially in the morning, would occur and usually disappears after your 12 to 16 weeks because this corresponds to your plateauing and eventual decline of your Beta HCG, which is responsible for your morning sickness. Okay, what else happens? So the frequency in maturation occurs. 
So you go to the bathroom more often. So this is true to the congestion of bladder mucosa and irritated bladder by your pregnant uterus. So another mechanism would be the uterus rests on the bladder, especially if the position of the uterus is antiverted. Okay. Another reason would be the change in maternal osmoregulation, which leads to your polyuria and the like. This also disappears in the 12th month. Okay. So frequency and maturation more pronounced in the first trimester. We will see how it progresses in the second and third trimester in the latter states. Okay. What happens to the breast? So your breast start is to, starts to have physiological changes. It starts to enlarge. It starts to get heavy. There's slight discomfort breaking sensation, which would occur usually in the six to eight week, especially in the primary gravity. Appetite changes. So there would be your usual cravings. It would either be wanting something more than usual or refusal of intake of a certain type of food. So it's either craving or refusal of a particular type of food. Okay, usually pregnant patients would adjust hormonally and frequently develop fatigue that may occur in pregnancy. They are have a higher tendency to sleep. They are irritable, etc. So those are symptoms. These are signs. As mentioned, it's more evident in a primary gravid at six to eight weeks. So what are the signs? You will see increased vascularity. The veins will become visible. Okay. Your nipple would be more pigmented. Your primary areola would be more pigmented. And a secondary areola will appear. Okay, that's pigmentation. Your tubercles, Montgomery tubercles in the areola, so would appear. So these are your dilated sebaceous glands. And as early as the 12th week, you may express colostrum. So this is a thick yellowish secretion which you know would be your starting breast milk for your pregnant patient. Okay, breast signs. Okay, so this is what it would look like. So your non-pregnant patient, compared to your early pregnancy, compared to your late pregnancy. Observe how... There's increased pigmentation, both of the nipple and your primary areola, and the appearance of a secondary areola, which um, starts early pregnancy, but more emphasized on your early pregnancy. So there would be two different colors, okay, for your primary and your secondary areola. So these are your tubercles. So these are your dilated sebaceous glands. Okay. That is how it would look like in the pregnant patient. Okay. So those are breast changes. Your abdomen. What is the expected change in your abdomen? Okay. First trimester, you wouldn't feel anything because the uterus remains a pelvic organ until the 12th week. At most, you will feel it in the abdomen as a suprapubic bulge. But before the 12th week, it would remain 
under your Linnea terminalis okay, as a review and remain a pelvic organ. So your abdominal findings, your, your Leopold maneuvers would not take, be into prominence at the first trimester. Okay. Pelvic changes. So there we have the signs. Okay. So know these signs. You will have to know your Jacquemere's or Chadwick's, Osiander's sign, and your Goodell's sign. Okay. These are more prominent in your first trimester. Okay. What are these? What do this mean? Okay. So first would be your Chakramiers or your Chadwicks, okay? And your cervix, which is usually pinkish, turns into a dusky U of the vestibule and anterior vaginal wall, which is visible at the eighth week, okay? And it more is more pronounced as pregnancy advance and is, of course, more definitely present in your multipara. Of course, the dusky U is because of your vascular congestion. Okay, I remember it as Chadwick's change in color. So color change, think of Chadwick, all right, if it's related to color. Next would be Oshander's sign. So a shanter sign would simply mean there's increased pulsation, which is felt to the lateral fornices beginning on the eighth week. Okay. And your good sign, your cervix becomes soft as early as the sixth week. This is more pronounced on the external os and in the upper part. So cervix feels like the lips of the mouth. So the cervix would usually be firm. But for the pregnant patient, it becomes softer, like the touch of the feel of your lips. Okay, That's how soft it would be. So in speculum exam, what would it look like? So there's bluish discoloration due to vascularity would end up and would be soft. So that would be your cervical changes. Okay. For the uterus, even if you haven't started to um, feel it in the abdomen, changes in the uterus can be felt through your bimanual examination. So what happens? It becomes enlarged, it becomes soft in consistency, and it becomes globular in shape. Okay. So, you have your Hegar sign then, and this is usually el elicited between 6 to 10 weeks. Okay. So, this is softening of the isthmus. Okay. So what's done? So you have two fingers okay, in the anterior fornix, okay, like so in the diagram. The fingers of the other hand pressing through the abdomen. The fingers of both hands can be approximated as the lower part of the uterine body, which is soft and empty. And that you would feel would be your isthmus. Okay, I remember your Heger sign because the isthmus would have the letter H. So if it's Heger's, it's softening of the isthmus. Okay, that's uterine changes. Okay. Palmer sign. Okay, some would feel uterine contractions felt on by manual examination. Okay. And of course, we have your beta-HCG. So these are tests. So those were 
objective signs previously, this one are the tests that we request. And more at the front front of pre any pregnancy would be measuring your HCG. Okay. This is only released by your tropoblastic tissue that is produced by growing fetus and placenta. Okay. And it's your present in your circulation, either as an intact dimer, an alpha or beta subunit, or a degraded form or beta core fragment of your HCG. And when is it detected? Material serum and urine from 8 to day, 10 days of conception. Okay, so if it's Conception is usually around four weeks. As early as four weeks, you could have a positive pregnancy test. 5% in patients eight days after conception and 11 days after your percentage rises to 98%. Okay, so this is the earliest sign of test that would get go positive in pregnancy. Okay. In the urine, so that's zero, 23 to 24 days after conception, and your HCG would peak at your 10 to 12 weeks gestation and then plateau before falling. Okay. So what are the blood tests that use beta HCG? So these are used only for special cases and for obstetric history and suspicion of your ectopic pregnancy. So this would be your qualitative blood test. So it's reserved for specific purposes, especially if we suspect ectopic, okay? Because the values will be quite different, okay? The assays that we use would be the following, radioimmunoassay, immunoradiometric assay, your ELISA, and your fluoroimmunoassay. Okay, what are the differences? So for your radioimmunoassay, your sensitivity is quite lower than the rest, 5 milli international units per ml. Takes 4 hours to complete. Post-conception age when positive, 10 to 18 days. Gestational age when positive, 3 to 4 weeks. Okay. For your immunoradiometric assay, you have a higher sensitivity that at 150 can be completed 30 minutes. Positive post-conception at 18, 20 days. And positive at 4 weeks. Your ELISA would be more sensitive and it takes faster, two minutes. Positive at 25 to 28 days and at five weeks. And your fluoroimmunoassay, 25 sensitivity, time to complete, 80 minutes, but can be detected earlier at 3.5 weeks. Okay. HCG would be one of the easier things that we do to detect pregnancy and there are home kits about. Okay. For OBGYNs, we use and request for an ultrasound. Okay. So this would show an intradecidual gestational sac which is identified as early as 29 to 35 week, days of gestation. Your gestational sac and your yolk sac would be five menstrual weeks. Okay. So it has delayed detection compared to your HCG. Your fetal pole and your cardiac activity would start to appear around six weeks and 
demonstrable embryonic movement by ultrasound would be at seven weeks. Okay. By 10 weeks, your Doppler can pick up the heart rate reliably. Okay? That is ultrasound. Okay. So, first trimester, any questions? So, our next trimester, second trimester would be next. Okay. Of course, your amenorrhea would still be there because patient is pregnant. Morning sickness and urinary symptoms gradually decrease. Okay. Morning sickness because your HCG becomes lower. Urinary symptoms because it's not resting anymore of the bladder because it's not a pelvic organ anymore. Your abdominal changes would become more pronounced. Okay. And as your fetus grows, you have what you call quickening. So this is perception of fetal movements by the pregnant woman. Okay. It usually occurs 18 to 20 weeks in the first prim primary gravid, earlier for multipara at 16 to 18 weeks. Fetal movements perceived by the pregnant woman is called quickening. Okay. So these are is something, for example, your patient is unsure. It's not always the case that your patient would know exact date of menses for various results. So quickening is also one of the um, things that you could do to estimate age of gestation, estimate your date of due date. Okay. What other changes may occur in the second trimester? You have your skin pigmentation changes. So this is called cloasma. So this is irregular brownish patches of varying size which appear on the face and neck and is usually caused your mask of pregnancy. Of course, if you are Caucasian, that's more evident than us Asians who have browner or um, darker skin. Okay, same way, you have your in abdominal inspection. There are skin changes as well, starting from your Linnea nigra. So this is your line. Extending from your symphysis pubis to your enciform cartilage or your siphoid process around. And this usually appears at 28th week. Okay. Inspection, there's linea nigra. What else could happen? Striae could happen. Skin pigmentation, that's both pink and white. That's visible, more pronounced in your lower abdomen more towards the flanks. It's more uh, mid, more peripheral. Okay, what else could happen? Inspection. Your diastasis rectile, so this is your rectus muscles, especially if your abdominal muscles are weak, may separate in the midline. Or if you have and enlarge abdomen. <clears throat> Inspection still. You could have spider telangiectasia. So this would be vascular stellate marks, which would result from high levels of estrogen. Okay. So we're done with inspection. Palpation course would be the one of the basic um, skills that we do in obstetrics would be measuring the fundic height. Okay, 
So we increased weight and progressive enlargement of the uterus, measurement of which would start from your symphysis pubis up to the fundus of your uterus. <clears throat> okay. So your abdominal examination, what's the importance of your fundic height? This would also tell you, give, look, give you clues to check for your age of gestation and if it concurs with your LMP, if it concurs with your quickening, if it concurs with your ultrasound. Usually, at the 20th week, it's at the level of the umbilicus. And it usually corresponds to age of gestation from 16 to 32 weeks. Okay? So, so in general, the uterus is described as ovoid and feels soft and elastic. Okay, what are your other abdominal observations? So you have your Braxton Hicks contractions. So what are these? So these are intermittent, painless contractions that you could detect by abdominal exam. Okay, we should not confuse this with contractions that will lead to preterm labor. Okay. Uh, for now, we know that normally there is such thing called Braxton Hicks, which is an intermittent painless contractions detected by abdominal examination. Knowing your contractions of preterm labor will leave it to your OB2 next year. Okay. So, these are active fetal movements and can be felt as intervals by placing the hand over the uterus as early as your 20th week. Okay. And your uh, as your fetus enlarges, you will have, have your external ballotment. So this is usually starting at 20 weeks, also through an abdominal exam. So now you could palpate your fetal parts and fetal movements by the obstetrician at 20 weeks. Okay. And of course, you auscultate. You, as early as 20 to 24 weeks, you could hear it by your Pinard's stethoscope. Okay. Clinically, I know you, there's Doppler, but when you do go into the clinics, chain your ears so that you could hear fetal heart tones through the stethoscope. Okay. So there are different sounds aside from the heart tones. So you have your funic or your fetal souffle. This is due to the rush of blood to your umbilical artery. And your uterine souffle, which would be a soft blowing and systolic murmur, which is heard in the sides of the uterus. And this is synchronous with your maternal pulse. Okay, sonography, which of course still has a role in your tests. Okay, at 18 to 20 weeks, you could have a detailed survey of your fetal anatomy, the central localization, and integrity of the cervical canal. Okay, you could do your congenital anomaly scan, check for fetal viability, and for radiology at 16 weeks, you could see a fetal skeletal shadow. Okay. That is for the second trimester. Okay. Third trimester, your amenorrhea persists. So your abdomen continues to enlarge and would eventually lead to discomfort of the patient 
either producing a palpitation feeling or dyspnea on exertion as the abdomen enlarges. Okay? There's lightening by your 38th week. So what is lightening? So that's a sense of relief of the pressure symptoms due to engagement of the presenting part. Okay. There's frequency of maturation. Now, because the abdomen is so enlarged, your bladder becomes compressed already. And of course, your fetal movements are more pronounced. So what are the signs? You have your still, your skin changes, but are more prominent with increased pigmentation and striae. Your uterine shape becomes cylindrical to spherical beyond the 36th week. More evident Braxton Hicks, more evident fetal movements. Okay. Your fundic height, junction of the upper and middle third up to 32 weeks. Level of the cyphoid process up to 36 weeks. And eventually comes down to 32 weeks because at, of engagement, your fetus starts to come down. And you know that once it decreases, labor will ensue. Okay. Easier to palpate fetal parts, easier to detect your heart sounds. Okay. Sonography, you check for your fetal growth assessment, which is more accurate. And it's important to look at your amniotic fluid assessment. Okay. Your amniotic fluid normally would increase at 38, would peak at 38 weeks and then would slightly decrease at 40 weeks. That's why it's important to determine your AFI, especially if the patient is past the due date. Okay. What are the differentials for pregnancy? Of course, any enlargement, you think of fibroid, cystic ovarian tumor, encysted tubercular peritonitis, hematometra, a distended bladder, or pseudocyesis. Pseudocyesis is, sorry, is a condition that occurs when your mother wants to get pregnant and thinks that she is pregnant but actually is not. So you have to be careful because they know the symptoms, what the symptoms could be, etc., etc. Okay? There was an occurrence that someone was able to convince an OBGYN to do a cesarean section on her. Opened the abdomen patient was not pregnant. So it happens. So don't rely. You have a lot of ways to diagnose pregnancy in all trimesters. So that is a never event, meaning that could never happen. But sometimes it's it does if you're not careful. Okay? And you have to be Careful on that. Okay. Let me end this topic by ending it with dividing. If we divide it initially by trimester, now we divide it into presumptive, possible, and um, positive signs of pregnancy. Okay. What are the following? So presumptive, what does presumptive mean? 
So they may resemble pregnancy but are non-specific, meaning there are a lot of other conditions that could cause the following. A lot of conditions may cause nausea with or without vomiting. A lot of conditions would cause disturbances in urination, could cause fatigue, could cause maternal perception of fetal movement, could cause breast symptoms. So these symptoms, presumptive. Okay. Signs, presumptive. A lot of conditions may cause amenorrhea, thermal signs, anatomic breast changes, skin pigmentation changes, and changes in your vaginal mucosa. So, consider pregnancy, but also rule out your other possible changes, possible systems involved. Okay, probable. Signs that indicate pregnancy majority of the time, but may still be caused by something other than pregnancy. Okay. So, probable, your abdomen's enlarged. There may be a baby inside, but again, there, it could be myoma. Changes in the size, shape, and consistency of the uterus. Changes in the cervix. Braxton Hicks contractions, balotment, physical outlining of the fetus, and positive results of endocrine tests. Remember, your HCG could be positive in some tumors, in some obstetric conditions like PCO. So you cannot take your HCG as an absolute or as a positive evidence of pregnancy. It is just probable. Okay. There are just three positive evidences of pregnancy. This is your guarantee that the presence of pregnancy and you cannot mistake it for any other conditions. And these are the following. When you have identified fetal heart tones. Okay. When there's perception of fetal movement by the examiner and not of the mother. Okay, let me be clear on that. And, of course, if you have detected your embryo or your fetus by ultrasound. So there's just three. Fetal heart tones, fetal movement by the examiner, and ultrasound imaging as your positive evidences of pregnancy. And that ends my lecture on normal diagnosis and pregnancy. Any questions so far? Doctor, I asked some questions in the chat box. Oh, wait, let me see. Let me It open. In first trimester, early pregnancy, how we differentiate uterine pregnancy? Oh, that's more focused on your Abdo um, abdomen uh, abnormal pregnancy, but suffice it to say, your beta HCG would have different ranges. So that's why, as I said, your blood serum HCG would be done in ectopic and your other special considerations, such as your high deform mole, etc. Because, for example, in H mole, your HCG would be high, much, very much higher. Okay. In ectopic pregnancy, you would have a concept such as your um, discriminatory value 
So usually pregnancy that is ectopic would range around 1,500 to 2,000 HCG. Okay? So the va the values would be would differ. And at what age can we diagnose ectopic pregnancy? Usually ectopic pregnancy would occur first trimester. So that that would be your closed differentials. Bleeding in the first trimester, think of abortion, think of ectopic pregnancy. Okay? Of course your ectopic pregnancy would cause abdominal pain and what we don't want with ectopic pregnancy would it would become ruptured okay of course when your ectopic pregnancy is in the fallopian tube once your fetus grows your fallopian tube is not equipped to expand so of course it will rupture and thereby cause peritonitis abdominal pain that's why usually your ectopic pregnancy would manifest in symptoms uh, at around six to eight weeks or up to 10 weeks, okay, depending on the site. Okay, you will know much about that later. Okay, because of the universality of your ultrasound and earlier diagnosis, ectopic pregnancy, if diagnosed early, could have you would have it would be easier to treat could not could not be surgical and you would avoid the complications okay how we do calculations in scan to detect down syndrome usually the down syndrome there are ultrasound findings that's closely related to downs um that would be your nuchal fold but it would not have quite a, it's still non-specific. Calculate anti-scan at 12 weeks with double marker for trisomy 21. So that would be your new, no, what's the anti-scan? What do you mean by anti? Doctor, it is the scan which we do at uh, 12 to 13 weeks nuchal to see the nuchal transparency. Yeah. You're in here. That's the nuchal fold that I'm mentioning. Okay. Yes, doctor. That at your level, that's nice to know. Okay. That would be an ultrasound diagnosis uh, as you look at it to detect Down syndrome. Um, uh, intrapartum. Ah, uh, intrapartum. Uh, while the page, the, while the fetus is inside, uh, that would, as I've said, that would detect Down syndrome, but it's non-specific, uh, not that sensitive. Okay, we calculate EDD by LMP and ultrasound. Which EDD we need to consider in pregnancy? Okay, the only way that we can compute for AOG would be LMP, all right? But you know, we can we compute it first to your first week, okay? First day of last menses. And you know that conception may not occur, will not occur on the first day because you know when will fertility period occur? It usually is at 9 to 15 days after your first day of menses. So, you will have your two-week difference, okay? So, your EDD, we will always say, would be plus or minus two weeks, okay? So, anything, not sure within two weeks, okay? So, that precedes my answer to your question number three. If you have your EDD calculated by your AOG and your EDD cal calculated by your ultrasound, yes, I do agree most of the times it will not be the exact date. So you may compute EDD by LMP is January 1. EDD by ultrasound is January 4. Is it acceptable? 
what do you follow? So, if it's within two weeks, you follow your age of gestation by LMP. Always. Your LMP will win over your ultrasound. If it's within two weeks. Okay. Now, if it's more than two weeks, for example, your EDD is January 1, your due date by ultrasound turns out to be January 20. So that's a difference of three weeks. So what is done? Then you request for another ultrasound. And then that third, that second ultrasound, you will look at what it is nearer to. Okay? And that is what you will follow. That is why you have your AOG according to LMP. And you will see there would be instances where you use your AOG according to ultrasound. Doctor, is it because of the late conception? Because the only the way that... Yes, because again, as I've mentioned, the difference of two weeks... Because at this point, even with the advancement of technology, there is no way that we could determine what is the exact date of conception. And the only concrete way that we could indicate fertility at this point would be our first day of our last menses, which we know would have a error factor of two weeks because first day, we are, we have menses, we are only fertile at 9 to 15 days. Okay, so there would really be two weeks of possible difference. And that is the maximum. Hence, by theory, we do the ultrasound. And if it's the difference is more than two weeks, we repeat it after an interval, and we look at where it would be nearer. Would it be, would the second determination be nearer the ultrasound, which is usually the case, if it does not match, or if it would be nearer your LMP, which will mean that there would be error in reader judgment or error in measurement. Okay? And in addition, ultrasound, according to the trimester, First trimester, you look at your crown rump length. So first ultrasound would be the most reliable basis of age of gestation if you do your early ultrasound early. Crown rump length. Why is it the most reliable? Because it would offer least variation, no effects of nutrition yet, no effects of genetics yet, no effects of infection yet. So the importance of your early ultrasound cannot be emphasized enough. Okay. Second, if the first ultrasound was done in the second trimester or second trimester, you look at your biparietal diameter. So that's the most accurate indicator of age of gestation. And if it's done in the third quarter, you look at your femoral length. Okay. Other Bio, Non-biometric parameters of fetal age would be like the maturity of the placenta, etc., um, etc. Et but again, um, those ultrasound findings, um, you're not supposed to know yet, but I'm just answering the question. So that you will see that there's more to the LMP computation and that's how we... Do it in obstetrics. Okay. Any more clarifications? I do appreciate the questions. Okay. So if there are no more questions, let's proceed with the um, next part, which would be the evaluation of the fetal pelvis. Okay, so here you will appreciate what you learned, hopefully still retained in your anatomy lectures of the reproductive system. Okay. 
and it would be i know there would be a lot but um i leave the insertion origin etc attachment to anatomy and we focus on the clinical aspects of the evaluation of the fetal pelvis in this lecture okay So we review the composition of the bony pelvis, look at pelvic anatomy, look at the planes, the shapes, and the soft parts of the pelvis. Okay? So composition of the bony pelvis. So we know that the three major parts of the pelvis, pelvic bone, would be your ilium, your ischium, and your pubis. Okay, ilium in red, ilium in green, uh, ischium in green, pubis in yellow green. Okay, so the parts, okay, I leave it to you. Uh, what's important would be your ischial spine uh, in obstetrics. So your ischial spine and your ischial tuberosities which we will encounter in our latter slides. As you know, this would be more or less the diameters that your, your fetus must traverse to be able to go out of your mother's pelvis. Okay, so pelvic anatomy, you have your false pelvis and your true pelvis. So your false pelvis, would be your anything above your linea terminalis. So it's bounded posteriorly by the lumbar vertebra, laterally by the iliac fossa, and in the front, your lower anterior abdominal wall. Okay. Your true pelvis lies below your linea terminalis. So that's bounded superiorly by your linea terminalis, superiorly by your promontory and ala of the sacrosacrum, anteriorly by the upper margin of your pubic bones, ascending superior rami of the ischial bones and obturator foramina, and inferiorly by the pelvic outlet, and laterally, by the inner surface of your ischial bones and your sacrosciatic notch and ligament. Okay, we will see later the importance of these boundaries. Okay. So, this would be your important diameters. You have your transverse diameter, 13.5. You have your interspenous diameter which is 10 usually. Okay. Your ischial spines are important also. Symphysis pubis, and this is your obstetric conjugate, which is the important clinically 10.5. Okay. So you have your obstetric planes and diameters. Okay. So you have your inlet, you have your outlet, med, med pelvis, and the plane of greatest pelvic dimension, which would be not important. So you have your important planes, you have your inlet, mid plane, and pelvic outlet. Okay? So... Your pelvic inlet, so it's the brim of your true pelvis. So this is along your linea. So this is your superior strain. Okay, and it's also called the superior plane of the true pelvis. And it has four diameters. It has your AP diameter. The most important would be your diagonal conjugate. Okay. You also have your true conjugate and your obstetric conjugate. You have your, that's here, 
from your symphysis pubis to your promontory. You also have your transverse diameter and you have two obliques. Okay. As you could see, the important part of this hole is that a fetus could traverse that passageway. Okay. The most important would be your diagonal conjugate because it's the only anteroposterior diameter that can be measured clinically. So like so. So this is the distance between the lower border of your symphysis pubis to midpoint of your sacral promontory. Okay, so this measures approximately 12 centimeters. Some would have 11, okay? Some would say 11.5. Okay, so, okay. So this is done by Dr. Irabon. The pointer in the middle finger. What's the point for the same position to be Proximate measurement of the diagonal conjugate. Okay. So you then have your true or anatomic conjugate. So this is the distance between your upper margin of your symphysis pubis to the midpoint of your sacral promontory. So this would be your true diameter. But we could only measure it by measuring your diagonal conjugate. So we measure it by subtracting 1.2 centimeters from your diagonal conjugate measurement. So for example, if your diagonal conjugate is 13.2, is so you could approximate that your true conjugate would be around 11 centimeters. Okay, uh, 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 around 13 centimeters. Okay, your obstetric conjugate would be the midpoint of your inner surface of symphysis pubis to midpoint of sacral promontory. Okay, clinically important because it's the shortest distance between the sacral promontory and the symphysis pubis. And you subtract 1.5 to 2 centimeters from the diagonal conjugate. So if it's 13, then your obstetric conjugate would be around 11 to 11.5. Okay. Your oblique. So extend from your sacroiliac joints to the opposite iliopubic eminence. And this measures. 13 centimeters. Okay. Your transverse diameter, this is constructed at right angles to the obstetrical conjugate and represents the greatest distance between your linea terminalis on either side. So this usually intersects the obstetrical conjugate at a point approximately 5 centimeters in front of the promontory. Then the average is 13 centimeters, and this divides your inlet into what you have seen, anterior and posterior segments. Okay? So this would be your posterior sagittal diameter. Okay. And the plane of the greatest pelvic diameter, it's the roomiest plane. It's at the third third to fourth sacral vertebrae bounded posteriorly, laterally by the ischial bones, anteriorly by the middle surface of the symphysis pubis, and could average around 12 to 5 centimeters. Okay, that's your inlet. Now we have your mid pelvis. And this is measured at the level of your ischial spines. 
This is clinically important because it's the plane of the least pelvic dimensions. So if you have, would have a problem of the passageway, most commonly it would occur at the mid pelvis. Okay. So during labor, the fetal head descent into the true pelvis may be described by station. And the middle mid pelvis and your ischial spines would serve to mark station zero. Okay, AP diameter through the level of the ischial spines would normally measure at least 11.5 centimeters. Okay. So this mid pelvis extends from the lower margin of the symphysis pubis to the level of the ischial spines up to the tip of the sacrum. Okay. So what's important would be your interspinous diameter. So this would be your smallest diameter. So this is one on red. Okay. This is also marked the station zero when the viperital head Fetal head passes this diameter, so it should be more than 10 centimeters. Okay, so this would be your AP diameter of your mid plane, the one on red. Okay, what are the instances where we suspect that the mid pelvis is contracted or has problems? As we have mentioned, if your ischial spines are prominent, of course, if these are prominent, this would pose a problem for passage. If your side walls are convergent and you have a sarhalo sacrum and you have an interspinous diameter of 8 centimeters. Okay. Next would be the outlet. Okay. The pelvic outlet consists of two approximately triangular areas. So it's your posterior and your anterior triangle. Okay. So they have a common base, and that is your ischial tuberosity. Okay. So you have your anterior posterior, you have your transverse, and your posterior sagittal as the diameters of your pelvic outlet. Okay. So you have your caldwell molloy anatom anatomical classification of the pelvis. So know the shapes. So its concepts aid on understanding of labor mechanisms. Okay. What's important? The greatest transverse diameter of the inlet and its division into anterior and posterior are used to classify gynecoid, anthropoid, android, or platypoid. Of course, by semantics, you would want a gynecoid pelvic shape. Okay. Posterior segment determines the type of pelvis, wherein the anterior segment determines the tendency. Okay. So, for example, a gynecoid pelvis with an android tendency, so it means that a posterior pelvis is gynecoid and the anterior pelvis is Android shape. Okay. So these are the types. Of course, you would see most likely your you would want a gynecoid because it would have greater diameters. Android, anthropoid, platyloid may pose problems to mechanisms of labor. So Gynecoid is a female pelvis and is most common, 41 to 42% of women, and it's the ideal shape for childbearing. So it has a well-rounded anterior, well-rounded lateral, and posterior segments. Okay. If it's android shape, I think your baby would have a hard time passing through this android shape. Okay. But it still occurs in a significant amount of white women non-white women less so. So it's a heavy heart-shaped pelvis, increased incidence of posterior fetal position, and increased incidence of forceps delivery, and you have a contracted mid-plane and outlet, which increase cesarean delivery. Anthropoid, 
common in non-white and white women. So this would be common in non-white compared to your android. So oval with AP diameter greater than the transverse. It's well rounded and um, anterior segment narrower than your posterior and it pos favors your posterior fetal position but still adequate for vaginal delivery. Okay. Platypoloid is rare, not conducive to vaginal delivery. So less than 3% occurrence in both white and non-white. So it's a flattened gynecoid type pelvis and wide transverse diameter and short AP diameter and widest of all pelvic angles. Okay? So, and um, again, your obstetric pelvic measurements that are adequate for vaginal in in delivery would include a transverse inlet measured in the greatest distance between your linea and either side of pelvis should be 12 cm or more, or your obstetrical conjugate from the middle of the sacral promontory to the middle of the inner surface of the symphysis should be 10 or more. Okay. So that would be the bony parts. Important also would be your soft parts. Okay, your pelvic floor would be composed of muscles that would separate your pelvic cavity from your perineum. Okay, there are three sets. Your pubcubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, and your puborectalis. Of course, you know that as your Elevator and okay. your diagram. Anteriorly, you have your urogenital triangle. Anal triangle would be your posterior triangle. Okay. Nerve supply of which would be your S4, inferior rectal nerve, and perineal branch of your pudenda. So what's the importance of the soft parts of the pelvis? It would support your pelvic organs, control of your external anal sphincter, and stabilize your sacroiliac and sacrooxygeal joints. When you go into normal labor and delivery, there would be instances where you have to do an episiotomy on these muscles and sometimes rip the anal sphincter for the baby to be delivered. Okay. So your pelvic diagram would be your levator ani plus your coccygeus, sorry, muscles plus a fascial covering. That's your pelvic diagram. Okay. Your vaginal birth conveys risk, as I mentioned, to damage to these muscles or to its innervation. Most commonly damaged would be your pubococcygeus muscle. So evidence supports that these injuries may produce dispose women to poor pelvic organ prolapse or urinary incontinence. Okay, your anterior triangle would contain your urethra and vagina. Okay, so portions of your internal pudendal and compressor urethra and uretrovaginal sphincter muscles, which would form your urogenital sphincter complex. Your anal triangle would contain the ischioanal fossa, anal canal, and your sphincter complex, which would consist of your internal anal sphincter, external sphincter, and your puborectalis. So the branches of your pudendal and internal pudendal nerve are also found within this triangle. Okay. So in summary, we have the composition of the bony pelvis. You have to know your pelvic anatomy, true pelvis, false pelvis, planes of the pelvic bony pelvis, your inlet, mid pelvis, and outlet, and pelvic shapes gynecoid, android, anthropoid, and platypoloid, and the soft parts of the pelvis, the vader ani, and pelvic diagram. Of course, the references of which would be your 
Williams obstetrics, okay, and um, some diagrams were um, lifted from our Philippine obstetrics books, okay? That would end my lecture for this morning. Okay, just to summarize, outlet, uh, inlet, there's just one important thing to remember. It is your conjugate. Excuse me, yours. doctor. Yes. We can't see the slide, doctor. Uh, no more slides. Okay. Doctor. Okay, just a review. Um, you have to inlet, you have to reach your sacral promontory. For it to be adequate, again, if you are if you are doing your internal examination and you reach your promontory, then your pelvis is contracted. It for it to be adequate, you should not be able to reach your could you mute? You should not be able to reach your sacral promontory. So that's the first. Um, I, I'll open my camera. So that's the first thing that you should do. You do your internal examination. Try to reach for your promontory. More often than not, you will not reach it. Okay. So you do an examination like this to look for the diameter. What's the next? What's the next step? You evaluate the mid plane. So you look at the curvature. So you have to do your sacral curvature. It has to be hollow and roomy. Then you measure your sacrosciatic notch. It has to admit one to two finger breaths. Okay. Then your ischial spines should not be prominent and your side walls should not be convergent. So for the mid plane, you have four. Ischial spines should not be prominent. Side walls should not be convergent. Sacrosciatic notch admits two to one to one half to two finger breaths, and your sacral curvature should be hollow. Okay, and then you remove your examining hand finger. You check for the outlet before removing. You check for the coccyx if it is movable. Then the other two. Uh, parameters for your outlet would be your intertuberous diameter would admit a fist and your suprapubic angle would be more than 90 degrees. Okay, so for your inlet, sacral promontory should be rich. For your midplane, there are four. Sacral curvature should be hollow. Prominent ischial spines are not prominent, side walls are divergent, and sacrocyanic notch admits one to two finger breaths. Outlet, your coccyx should be movable, your intertuberous diameter admits a fist, and your suprapubic arc should be more than 90 degrees. So that's the clinical evaluation to say that you have an adequate pelvis. So if you have that diameter, then you have a gynecoid pelvis. Any questions for this morning? Could you open your cameras and we will document? Could, could someone take screenshots and then send to my Viber, please? I'll also 